Acts chapter 17 verse 22. It says, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. Now obviously what is Paul is, was Paul telling here? He's obviously approaching the people here with grace, with love. He wants to win them for the Lord. But at the same time, he's not holding back from telling the truth. He's telling these people, hey, you guys are superstitious. You guys are believing in the wrong things. I mean, we, when we go out soul winning, we, we go to the people with grace and love and we tell them the gospel, we tell them faith alone, death, burial and resurrection of Jesus. But we also mention sometimes, especially we come across people who are believing in a, uh, uh, another religion. We tell them, hey, your religion doesn't teach this. Your religion preaches works. You need to deny your religion. You need to repent and trust in Jesus alone. And we say that out soul winning. We don't hide that, although it can be a little offensive to people, right? So the title of the sermon today is how to convert Hindus. How to convert Hindus. Okay. In India, the term conversion is a very, very sensitive topic. Okay. See, Indians in general, Hindus in general are nice people. Okay. They are very hospitable. If you go to India, they'll treat you like a king. Yeah. You're a special guest. They'll pour out the red carpet for you. But the moment you raise the topic of conversion, a lot of them get offended. Okay. In India, religion is very important. It is very sacred. It is almost like your own mother. Okay. The thing is, of course, people who convert, people who convert from another religion and they become Hindus, obviously we call them converts, yeah, converts. See, converts suffer a lot of persecution in India, most of the time. I have known many cases, okay, people who are Hindus and they became Christians, yeah. <clears throat> For example, they suffer persecution at home. I know people who get beaten by their parents because they want to go to church. They're arrested in the home. They said, you are not allowed to go anywhere. Okay. And if they go to church, they sneak out of the window, go to church. By the time they come back, there is a cane waiting for them and they get beaten. Yeah. And I've also heard of, uh, some, uh, uh, I've also known stories where women, especially, yeah, they are forced into marriage, which they don't like. Because the parents are afraid that uh, she might go to the church, fall in love with some Christian guy and get married. So they forcefully marry her to some Hindu guy. So she doesn't have the chance anymore to change her religion or whatever. It keeps happening. And of course, there are extreme cases where there are honor killings. Where somebody in the family gets converted, gets baptized. And the father would consider it an honorable thing to kill his own child. A brother will considerable, consider it an honorable thing to murder his own sibling because they have turned their back to Hinduism. People say, oh, you have been denied the culture. You have betrayed the love of your family. You have betrayed your identity. How dare you do that? You know, see the word convert is, isn't something new to us. Okay, In the Bible, the word con convert or convert or converted is mentioned 14 different times. 14 times it's mentioned in the Bible. So it's not mentioned like once or twice. We are not sure what it's talking about. Okay, turn with me to Acts chapter 3. Okay, turn back to Acts chapter 3. And while you're going there, I'll read from Matthew chapter 18 verse 3. And said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is saying, Except ye be converted, and you humble yourself, you cannot believe, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. You, a very important step for you to repent, for you to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ is that you need to cut down your pride. You know, that is the conversion that needs to take place. You need to humble yourself. And Acts chapter 3, if you look at verse 19, it says, Acts chapter 3 verse 19, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, and the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Now John the Baptist says, repent and believe. 
And here we see, repent ye therefore and be converted. Converted is synonymous to getting saved, to believe. You repent from whatever you were believing before and you repent towards Jesus in faith. And that is a conversion that takes place in every believer. Okay. Now, uh, the Bible says, you know, uh, we all know the great commission in Mark chapter 16 in Matthew chapter 28. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Yeah, that is a responsibility. That is a command given to every Christian by the Lord Jesus Christ to go out and preach the gospel. Christians are commanded to go and convert people. Okay, one of our tasks as Christians on this earth is to go and convert people. That is a primary thing. If you call yourself a disciple, if you say, I'm a disciple of Jesus, I serve Jesus, you need to be soul winning. Okay, if you just say, oh, I'm saved, I believe. Okay, you're a Christian. But if you call yourself a disciple, you need to be out there going door to door to the people, telling the gospel, and getting people saved. In other words, we need to be, every Christian, whether in India or outside of India, we need to be in the conversion business. Okay? And when I say business, I'm not saying making money. Jesus said, I'm about my father's business. It is something that we need to occupy ourselves with. It is something that we need to take seriously. We need to have a schedule where we are regularly, consistently going soul winning. That's what I mean when I say business. We need to be busy and we need to be organized. And we need to do it effectively, you know, as though we are doing it for a livelihood. Yeah, as though you're actually doing a job. Now in India, I've seen this my whole life. Whenever we talk about conversion, there are these bozo Christians who look up, who throw it on your face and say, Oh, we don't convert anybody. We don't convert anybody. It's the Holy Spirit of God who converts. We don't convert. Well, it's the same thing as uh, when people say, oh, we don't save anybody. <laughs> you know, we've, we've all heard this argument, we don't save anybody. Even in Germany, I was told this a lot of times. Christians told me, hey, you don't save anybody. We don't save anybody. You know, when I, when I hear that argument, I'm thinking like this. When somebody tells me that, buddy, do, you, do I look like an idiot? Seriously, do you think that I think that I'm shedding my blood for somebody? Seriously, of course, I, I, I'm not the one who sacrificed myself for somebody. It's Jesus who died. I'm just pointing them to the cross. You know, thereby I get them saved. I'm saving them. Right? This is something that I've preached before. We all know that. You know, and I would always like to use this example. When you find somebody on the street and then you pick them up and you take them to the hospital, to the emergency, and although it is the doctor who conducts the surgery and gets that person's life saved, you're also credited with getting that person saved. Because the doctor looks at you and says, hey, if you hadn't brought this person in time, he may not have survived. And when he wakes up, he'll thank you. Thank you for saving my life. You know, as a Christian, we point people to the Savior and we, and we get them saved. You know, we are entrusted with the ministry of reconciliation. Paul said, I am, I am become all things unto all men that I might save some. Was Paul wrong when he said that? Of course not. We become all things unto all men so that we might save some. We might save people. So there's nothing wrong in using the terminology, I got somebody saved or I got somebody converted. He's my convert. <laughs> you know, if I was going soul winning in India, I would prefer to use the word convert more than soul winning. You know, I would say, hey, let's have a conversion marathon. Hey, how many converts did you have yesterday? Oh, we had eight converts. Yeah, that is the word I would embrace. I wouldn't be afraid of all these naysayers and all the Hindu nationalists and all these Christian bozos. Oh, we don't convert anybody. Of course we do. We convert and that is a term that we, we need to embrace and we need to use without fear. And uh, let me just tell you, whenever I'm saying Hindus, you know, of course, a lot of you don't deal with Hindus. We are in Europe, you know, you may not come across Hindus as much as often. In your mind, you can always substitute it with unbelievers. Most of what I'm saying applies to unbelievers in general. Okay. 
See, that's the gospel in a nutshell. We all deserve to go to hell. In our human nature, we have all committed sin. Nobody is perfect. We are all liars. We all think bad things. We have all broken God's laws in one manner or the other. Right? And the thing is, sometimes we think of ourselves as good people because we compare ourselves with one another. But when we compare ourselves to a perfect morality, God, we are all sinners, we are all going to hell. But God doesn't want that. He doesn't want people to go to hell. He sent His Son, Jesus, to die for us. He took our place. He paid for our sins. Okay? He did the tough part. He did the good part. Okay? Because we are not good enough to go to heaven on our own merit. So he took that place and he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The only thing you got to do in order to escape your punishment in hell is to believe on Jesus. Faith alone, grace alone. You believe in Jesus and you get everlasting life. That is the gospel that we preach. Yeah. And very important, we also emphasize not only on faith alone, grace alone, but we also emphasize that you cannot lose your everlasting life. That is a very important thing. Once you are saved, once you receive everlasting life, you cannot lose it. Otherwise, God should stop being God. Eternal life is not eternal then. Yeah? If God gives you everlasting life and if he, if he takes it back, then that's not everlasting life, that's temporary life. And if God says, I give you everlasting life and I'll take it back, that makes God a liar. And the Bible clearly says, Titus 1 to God cannot lie. Amen. Now, when you approach the Hindus, when you come, uh, come across somebody who's a pantheistic, who believes many gods, what do you tell them? What is the gospel you tell them? It's the same gospel. It's the same thing that you tell them. You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But a very important step for the Hindus, which you must preach to them, like how Paul's, uh, like Paul said, repent. Yeah. Uh, which was sorry. Yeah, he says. <clears throat> thirty. Verse thirty. Right. Now commendeth all men everywhere to repent. Thank you, brother Ashley. Now, for a Hindu to get saved, he needs to deny his religion. He needs to deny all the other gods goddesses that he was trusting before and turn to Jesus alone, 100%. That repentance needs to be there for him to receive everlasting life. Okay, if you just tell them, you need to believe in Jesus, a lot of them say, okay, I believe in Jesus, great. It's just like uh, the situation on Mars Hill, plus one God. Okay, I believe in all these other gods, okay, I'll also believe in Jesus. That does not get people saved, that does not get a Hindu saved. He needs to understand, he needs to realize, he needs to believe that his religion is a false religion. Hinduism is a false religion. His gods are fake. They can't save him. They are dummies. Amen. And he needs to turn to Jesus only a hundred percent. And that's when he'll be saved. That's when he will receive the Holy Spirit. And that's when he'll have eternal security in heaven. The denying of gods is important. Obviously, when, we, when you go to atheists who don't believe in anything, we don't really stress on this. Oh, you need to repent. They don't have any gods. Sometimes they're just having no faith at all in anything. We tell them, hey, you need to repent from unbelief to belief. Okay, you just need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But when you approach people from other religions who are already believing in something else, then it, we, we preach them, you need to stop believing in that and believe in Jesus 100%. You know, um, <clears throat> If, uh, let's say, there is this uh, situation where a Hindu believes in Jesus, okay? You tell the gospel to a Hindu. He says, okay, I believe all my gods were false. My religion uh, doesn't uh, give me any security, doesn't save me. I believe 100% in Jesus. Now, is he saved? Yes. Right? What if, if he goes back to his old life? Yeah, he continues to call himself a Hindu. Okay, he continues to bow down to idols. He continues to go to the temples. He's still saved. He's still saved. He will still go to heaven. Okay, see an important step to believe on Jesus that he needs to stop trusting in those idols in his heart. Okay, now if I tell him, oh, you need to stop bowing down to idols, I'm preaching works. Now bowing down to idols is works. 
An important step is that he needs to stop trusting those idols in his heart. That's what gets him saved. Okay? Now there are Hindus who believe in the truth. They know in their heart that there's no life in these idols. But they'll still bow down to them. Why? Many reasons. They may be afraid of persecution. They don't want to be beaten at home. You know, like even in the Bible you see King Solomon. He was a safe believer. Still he bowed down to idols. He built altars. Why? Because he wanted to please his foreign wives. But he's still saved. Yeah? So there are Hindus who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who receive everlasting life. They may never live a Christian life. They may never go to church. They may just live a life full of idolatry. But you know what? Anyone, that is not something that we recommend. You don't say it's okay to do that. Because if a Hindu believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, becomes a child of God, and continues to live a Hindu life, God will punish him. God will child, he will not have peace in this life. He'll live a horrible life, you know. God will cause all kinds of pain because God is a jealous God. He doesn't want his child to bow down to idols. Yeah? But he'll still go to heaven. Amen. And irony is, in India, there are a lot of Hindus, okay? They convert to Christianity, okay? They convert for several reasons. But they're still believing in works. They're still John MacArthur people. <laughs> they still believe in repent of your sins. They still believe in making Jesus the Lord of your life. They still believe I have to stop drinking, stop smoking. Otherwise, I won't go to heaven. Now, will that Hindu slash Christian go to heaven? No. That conversion doesn't help him in any way. You know, because in India, for example, there are a lot of poor people who, who suffer caste discrimination. And they don't like their religion. They don't want to be part of Hinduism. So they said, oh, I'm going to better move to Christianity. You know, people become Christians for also carnal reasons. Even in charismatic churches, even in Germany, yeah, in these uh, bozo churches, these fun center churches, sometimes you have people giving testimony. I used to be an atheist and now I have a relationship with Jesus. <laughs> yeah. I mean, did that conversion help him in any way? Maybe it'll help him in his carnal issues or whatever. You know, but when he dies, he'll still go to hell. A Hindu who stops worshipping idols, who stops going to temples, who said, who will go through persecution, he'll get baptized, and will still believe in his works to save him, will go to hell. What a, what a pity. <laughs> See, you go through all the trouble, you go through all the persecution, just to get from one false religion to another false religion, and go to hell. And I've seen Hindus like that my whole life. <laughs> and uh, I want to expose some of the false ways in which uh, I've seen Christians trying to reach Hindus. Christians trying to convert Hindus. Okay, I've, I've grown up in a Christian family my whole life. I got saved very young. Yeah, My parents are Christians. They're born again believers. Most of my family, my relatives, they're all Christian. They're all going to heaven. I know that. But unfortunately... In India, let me just give you a small uh, history about India. In the 1800s, there were a lot of Baptist missionaries who did a lot of work in India, especially in my state, Andhra Pradesh. You have a lot of Baptist churches. In fact, our Telugu Bible was translated by a Baptist missionary in the 1800s. We have a really good Telugu Bible. It's much better than this NIV and all the other crap. Okay. And during this time, there were a lot of Christians. And also in the 70s, in the 60s and the 70s, in my city, in my home city, there was a movement called the Hebron Movement. It was started by a North Indian guy who, who became a, was a Sikh guy. Not, not, not like Sikh, he's a, from the Sikh religion. Yeah? And uh, he became a Christian, his name is Bhakt Singh, you can Google him. And he started a big movement, a soul winning church. It was a soul winning church. And they, used, they started, they planted a lot of churches, they got a lot of people saved, they preached the true gospel. But it is a thing of the past. You know, the, the, the leadership failed in the church, the church collapsed. And a lot of other new evangelical churches started cropping up in India. And then you have all this repent of your sins and all this false gospel. Pretty much very popular in my city. And even the saved people, even the believers who are saved, are intermingled with these false Christians, with, with Christians who believe you can lose your salvation. So that's why I believe a new IFB movement is very important in India. We need that <laughs> in India because, um, because of all the false teachers, you know. 
some 30 years ago, 40 years ago, yes, they were good Christians, they were good churches. Because the false teachings were not so um, <clears throat> popular. But now the false teachings are popular and all the good Christians and all the Christians have become so wishy-washy, so watered down. And these are all the false ways that I have seen my uh, growing up what Christians do. The number one, the number one false way in which Christians try to get Hindus saved is prosperity teaching. Prosperity teaching, it's everywhere in India. Okay, it's a greedy, it's a false teaching, right? The greedy people. Basically, what, what they are saying is, if you become a Christian, you will be successful in life. You will get money in life. You will get a nice house. You can send your children abroad. Yeah, or you can have a luxurious house. Your diseases will go away. Your cancer will go away. Believe on Jesus, become a Christian. Your family problems will go away. See, one thing is in the prosperity teaching, let me tell you, there is a kernel of truth to it. There is a kernel of truth. For example, if you believe in Jesus, you get saved. Yeah, You get a ticket into heaven. But when you actually do the works, when you serve God, when you are a disciple, when you are soul winning, you know, God promises to take care of your needs. Which means that you will not grow, you'll not go hungry, you'll not starve to death, you'll have raiment upon your body, you'll have a roof on your head. If you are a man who, who's got a family, God promises he will take care of your needs. You will not go in one. The Bible says, uh, I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. If you are a Christian, you're serving the Lord, God will take care of your needs. He will give you, you won't, uh, you won't run out of money at the end of the month, you know. <clears throat> but the thing is prosperity gospel is something it just goes to another extreme it says hey if you don't have a Bentley you're not really right with the Lord <laughs> you know? if you don't have a nice big apartment you're not right with the Lord you need to check your faith <laughs> yeah and the thing is the problem with the prosperity teaching is it's faith plus works it's faith plus works they teach they teach faith plus works they say hey if, if you're not um, for example we, we say if, if God is causing problems in your life as a Christian, what do we say? If, if, he's, if he's punishing you, you'll say, hey, you need to get right with the Lord. You need to check where your faults are. You need to get right with the Lord. But the prosperity teaching says, if you're going through problems, they'll say you are not saved. You see the problem there? See, whenever, if, you, if God is punishing you, if you're not successful in your life, if, if, if you're having all kinds of problems in life, we don't question your salvation. Because you're a believer. You know what you believe. We say you need to go soul, you need to get right with the Lord. But the prosperity teachers, they will add uh, faith to works and they say you're not saved, you, need, you will go to hell and that's a false gospel that they teach. And um, see, God's physical provision does not apply for salvation. When you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, it does not benefit you in, in any way physically speaking. It benefits your soul. You won't go to hell. But serving the Lord will also, pro he promises physical blessings. Not like, not like a Bentley and all these things. He will provide for your needs. Yeah. The thing is, what I've seen is that I've seen believers as well. Saved believers also using this prosperity teaching to try and win Hindus, unbelievers. They are against prosperity teaching. They even condemn prosperity teachers. But they think, oh, maybe if I, can, if I can tell them these things, maybe I can bring them to church, maybe they'll be interested in Christianity, and then someday they'll get saved. Like for example, they'll say, hey, you got cancer, hey, you believe in Jesus, your cancer will go away. You know, God will provide you healing. Hey, if you believe in Jesus, you know, all your family problems will go away. I've seen saved believers do that. Hey, do you have problems in your life? I've, I've seen this when they were going soul winning I said, hey, if you have problems in your life, believe in Jesus, your problems will go away. You will take away your problems. See, the thing is, let's say that person is interested. He say, yeah, okay, yeah, I'm having all these problems. Maybe he's right, I'll come to church. What if those problems don't go away after some time? What if he still ends up losing his job? What if their loved one still dies? Now they're going to hate God. <laughs> You know, if you make wrong promises as a believer, 
try to bring them to church trying to get them saved however oh, you you you're making wrong promises which you can't keep and if things go south in their life if their prayers are not getting answered they'll start hating you they'll start hating god they'll start hating the bible i've seen many such cases like for example there was this uh, i think you sent me a video link of one lady named esther yeah 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 somebody she she her, she was from a christian family okay she her parents became christians how they were living in a home and they had a lot of problems a lot of uh, uh, financial issues or whatever and they had a neighbor who was christian and he started becoming friends with them he started telling them hey if you believe in jesus your problems will go away you know you'll have financial success in your life and all that and because of that the family became christians they got converted they started going to church they rejected they threw away all the idols they said we're going to be christians and this lady she was a uh, around like 12 years or 10 years in that family she grew up with them and later she became a full blown atheist she she's talking against christianity she makes youtube videos attacking the gospel attacking god saying my parents were deceived by all this prosperity teaching you see what what, what prosperity teaching can do to people you know when when your prayers don't get answered or uh, or whatever you're not really saved you're not actually getting that person saved through prosperity teaching yeah people make false converts so that this is something that i've seen in india prosperity teaching no when we go tell the gospel we need to focus on the gospel yeah don't promise people god's blessings in return for faith alone yeah when we go to see when i go to people i go with this intention this person may not be alive tomorrow this person may not live tomorrow so what would you tell somebody who's on their deathbed would you tell them to stop drinking stop smoking <laughs> repent from your sins start going to church or would you say hey trust in jesus yeah you say trust in jesus right that's the gospel we preach if somebody comes to you and says uh, i have got this problem i've got that problem i've got cancer and all this yeah i'm so sorry to hear that man i'm so sorry you know but you know what If you were to die today, <laughs> again, do you know for sure that you're going to heaven? You know, I think uh, you guys last time in fourth time you met a guy who wanted to kill himself, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, he wanted to kill himself, and uh, I was thinking, man, if this guy is really decided he wants to kill himself, and nothing is going to change his mind, I would tell them, hey, you know what? It's okay. I can't change your mind. If you want to kill yourself, go ahead. But let me tell you the gospel so that you at least go to heaven after you die. we are not combining <laughs> salvation with works it's not what the bible says salvation is easy and the second problem the second thing that i want to expose number 1 is prosperity teaching number 2 the false way which i have seen christians use to convert hindus is apologetics apologetics okay um turn with me to titus 3 verse 9 See what is apologetics? Apologetics is basically this is a parachurch ministries. There are people who basically basically train you in how to have reasonable conversations with people, how to debate with people. You know, how to convince people that God exists, that the Bible is true, that Jesus is God. And let me tell you, all these apologetics they all deal with foolish questions. Foolish questions. And then the most common question is prove to me that god doesn't exist god god exists prove to me that god that's the that's the question that a lot of atheists throw at your face oh prove that god exists you know that is a foolish question <laughs> it's it's evident god exists look at the nature look at how you look at the creation you know you you tell them hey you know the bible says god exists there's one life one heaven one hell i can show you how uh you can go to you can be sure that you're going to heaven no 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 prove to me that god exists bye see i don't know if have you told the gospel to somebody who's who doesn't believe that god exists does he get saved usually <laughs> never <laughs> never they don't end up getting saved because they're all you know most of them are reprobates yeah titus chapter 3 verse 9 says but avoid foolish questions avoid foolish questions 
and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. They are unprofitable and vain. And apologetics ministry focuses on training you to debate with people. And I've never, ever, ever seen anyone who got saved as a result of somebody using apologetics. Never. Okay, growing up, one of the big um, organizations that everybody was running to was called RZIM. RZIM. Rapist Zacharias International Ministries. <laughs> you heard of that? Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. That guy was really famous and he was an adulterer. He was, a, he was abusing women at his old age. He was, he was an old, dirty old man. And he died of cancer. Amen. He's burning in hell. Amen. Yeah. And I'm not saying he's burning in hell because he committed adultery. No, he's burning in hell because he preached a false gospel. He shook hands with the Mormons. He shook hands with all the ecumenical people out there. Yeah. And he never preached the real gospel. He never preached faith alone, eternal security. He was getting along with the Catholics. He was getting along with the Seventh-day Adventists. And he showed up at the Mormon tabernacle and said, Hey, we hear the same thing. We need to put aside our differences. And we need to come together. That's what he, says. he preached the Mormons. He was invited by the Mormons in their tabernacle. He was an evangelical Christian. He was invited. Mormons are usually very... Con they don't invite these people. Yeah, They don't invite us. But they invited him. Why? Because he's so watered down. Because he's a fool. And, um, and he was a big thing growing up. Even people in my own uh, distant family, near family, they were part. They were paying a lot of money to uh, go and listen to him. I, 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 I went to his conferences. Yeah, I saw him preach, and I was so excited as a kid. Oh, we're meeting Ravi Zacharias, yeah, you know. And I used to. My dad used to buy all the DVDs, all the CDs of his preaching, and I used to collect them in a shoebox. Ravi Zacharias, Volume One, Volume Two, that, this, this, that. And the thing is, they were like one hour sermons, right? I never used to understand what he used to talk about. They were too complicated. I never, the only reason why I ever used to listen to this man was because he used to make good jokes. He used to tell nice stories about experiences, about this country, what happened. There was somebody in prison. He used to tell nice missionary stories. It's the only reason why I ever listened to that guy. Not, not because of the gospel. I never really understood most of what he was saying. I used to just wait for the next joke. When is he telling the next joke? <laughs> you know, <laughs> honestly. And you know what? What I've seen is that apologetics ministries, it turns good Christians into jerks. You know, all they learn is about how to talk, how to talk, how to show off. How much I know, I've read this book, I've read that book, this Greek word, that Greek word, that Hebrew word. All I have seen, people who get into this ministry, they're bad listeners. They don't listen. They're just interested in talking and talking and talking and talking all the time. Showing up, puffed up people. They don't do any soul winning. No soul winning among these people. You know what their idea is? Oh, I have this one colleague or I have this uh, student in my class, whoever. I want to tell them the gospel, but I don't know how. I will go to this conference and learn how to tell them the gospel. And all they're doing is debating with them. Even when they say, no, I'm not interested. The Bible clearly says a heretic after one or uh, two times, reject. Yeah. And these guys are going out 10 times, 20 times, over and over, over, trying to convince them that God exists, that Jesus is the true God. And they, these people never get saved like that. That is not the way you get people saved. That is not how you create converts. Jesus has told us how to create converts, how to get people saved. Is we go two by two, door to door, and you meet strangers, that's whom we tell the gospel. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't tell the gospel to your um, colleagues or your friends of course you can do that but what are the chances that they are so receptive it's very less if you just focus on your colleagues if you just focus on your friends i mean that's that you're just aiming too too low most of the time they don't get saved but when you go outside talk to people you, you've never met you're just going there with the love and the grace and with the word of god we end up getting people saved yeah see for example honestly let me admit i'm not uh, 
I'm in a position where I can't, uh, I'm not able to tell the gospel to my colleagues at work. You know, I, I'll admit to that. I don't go around trying to preach the gospel because I know most of them won't listen and I'm still a very junior person at work. They won't take me seriously. Really, you're telling me about God and every kind of thing, you know. So I spend most of the time telling strangers, people I don't know, and praying that somebody, some stranger will approach my colleagues and tell them the gospel. Okay, but if you're in a position where you're, okay, you're uh, driving together with your colleague, you're working together and you have the opportunity to tell them the gospel, of course you can do that. You can get people saved at your workplace. But if that is, on, if that is your mission, mission field, then okay, what if that person gets saved? What next? You better go soul winning, yeah? <clears throat> and this is the third, third uh, way that I've seen how, what Hindus use. Number one is a prosperity teaching. Number two, apologetics. Number three, fellowshipping with Hindus. Let's be friends with the Hindus. You know, this uh, home group that I was part of. Oh, Moses, he started with the home group again. <laughs> hey, I'd rather tell about my experiences than someone else's. Yeah. I'll, I'll give an example. Yeah. This, uh, me and brother Anthony, we made a video against this bozo called Christian Samraj. Yeah, he was very popular in Leipzig. He's now in India. He's a pastor of a Lutheran church. And while he was in Leipzig in Germany, he started a home group. Yeah. That used to take place in his living room, which is my living room now. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, there were a lot of people, a lot of people used to come. And I think one of the one day there were like 35 people, 35 people in my living room. They were sitting like this, yeah, and some of them were atheists, some of them were Buddhists, some of them were Hindus, you yeah? know, and while I was in the home group, we, we have this tradition, yeah, once in a year we have a fight site, a weekend away, we pick a place somewhere outside of Leipzig, spend the evening Friday till Sunday, uh, once a year, so in 2017, if I'm not wrong, we had a fight site somewhere close to Dresden, it was an old house, and with a backyard and during this time there was a Hindu couple who was, were coming to the home group it was a Hindu couple husband and wife yeah and we decided to take them to the fight side they, they came along to the fight side yeah to the weekend away so we planned games activities uh, Bible reading Bible discussions uh, cooking together cleaning up together all sorts of activities for these two days and then uh, and then we packed our bags. It was over. It was Sunday, Sunday afternoon. We were leaving back. And we sat in a circle like this. Okay, we sat in a circle. And each person uh, opened their mouth and uh, started to share how the past two days were. Okay, what I'm going to walk away with. And of course, it's the usual stuff. Some people say I'm more motivated to spend time with the Lord. I'm motivated to spend more time in prayer. I want to better my relationship. And all this usual stuff, which they don't, nobody ever ends up doing. It's just a high, right? So the turn fi uh, finally came to these Hindus, yeah, this couple. And this is what they said. Looking at you guys, the love that you have, the love that you have for people, how you practice your faith. We are also motivated to practice our faith in a more meaningful way. We are also motivated to take our faith seriously. <laughs> Buddy, hey, let me tell you this. If your Christianity is motivating Hindus to become better Hindus, <laughs> if your Christianity is motivating atheists to become better atheists, there's something wrong with your Christianity. You are an idiot. You know, as I was sitting there listening to this couple, I was like, man, we are failures. We're a bunch of failures. We just spat on the face of Jesus. These guys are sitting there and say, we want to be better Hindus. <laughs> <laughs> and that's exactly what this Christian Samraj, this bozo was. I've seen, I've walked with him. I was also sp spending a lot of time with him. I saw a lot of Hindus, you know, greeting him, coming to his home, spending time with him, talking to him. And they would always walk away thinking, oh, this guy is such a better Christian among all the other Christians. I want to become a better Hindu among all the other Hindus. That was his gospel. 
False teacher. See, is, is that the gospel what we preach? Are we going telling people become a better Hindu? Become a better Muslim? That will that, take them to hell. You know, people, Christians today have converted, have, have exchanged, have changed the gospel of Jesus to the gospel of goodness. Gospel of repent of your sins. They're trying to get people to live a good life. They want to bring Hindus to their group and they're trying to get them, hey, turn away from your drinking habits, turn away from your smoking habits. You know, be a good person. Hopefully, you know, that you know, I've, I've heard Christians say this, oh, this particular Hindu, he's such a good guy, God will bless him, God will save him. Why? Because he's a good person, yeah? What kind of a gospel is that? What kind of a foolishness is that? See, we shouldn't fellowship with unbelievers. We shouldn't fellowship with Hindus. Don't become friends with the world. The Bible says friendship with the world is enmity towards God. See, our friends are Christians, like-minded, born-again believers. These are my friends. These are the people whom I'll tell my problems to. These are the people I will take counsel from. Not from some Hindu, not from some atheist. You don't fellowship with them, okay? See, when there are churches today, there are home groups today, there are Bible studies today, which purely focus on, hey, we need to build communities. Jesus' message is about inclusion. So let's include, let's call in the Hindus, let's call in the Muslims, let's call in the Buddhists and the atheists and have fellowship with them. Let's have tea with them. Let's have dinner together with them. In, 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 in a closed group in the church. And that's what's happening with Germany. Churches in Germany have become worldly because they want to fellowship with unbelievers. Pastors are encouraging their congregation members, why don't you go have a beer with your unbelieving friend why don't you call him for dinner and have a discussion with him and all these things they don't do any soul winning see and people who go have fellowship with unbelievers Christians I'm telling Christians who go have fellowship they become worldly they get into alcohol they get into movies they get into pop music they get into filthy talk with the unbelievers that's why we shouldn't become friends with unbelievers sorry no of course, I'm not saying that you should be a jerk at work. See, when you're at work or you're in a university, of course, you'll have unbelieving people there. Yeah, but you will interact with them. You will talk to them, of course. You will probably even have your lunch break with them. But you, you, as a Christian, you need to know where to draw the lines. You know, I, I would interact with them, but I wouldn't go become like their best buddy or whatever. You know, like uh, back in my university, we used to constantly have, uh, or in my workplace, when I was in India, we used to constantly have excursions. We used to constantly have um, um, weekend out or dinner together or something like that. Where I have to go with uh, unbelievers, right? And one thing I've seen, a pattern, it's Christians who are usually compromising. It's a bad testimony. Most of the Christians, are they're the ones who are compromising. They're the ones who are drinking along with them. They're the ones who are participating on the filthy talk. And you know, people who distance themselves, although they're there, although they interact, but they draw a line. Those are Muslims that I've seen. Muslims are the ones who say, oh, no, I'm not going to drink that alcohol. I'm not going to do this. I'm not. They just stand and they'll, they'll talk with you, but they will not participate. I mean, what a shame, you know. It's the Christians who should be doing that, not the Muslims. Christians who say, okay, you know what, you guys, you guys, go ahead. I'm, I'm going to, you know, at work, focus on your work. At your, at your university, focus on your studies. Instead of, you know, getting, having fun or whatever with the unbelievers. No, I'm not against having fun. I mean, when we were, when we were in Switzerland, what did we do? We played laser tag along with our believers. Yeah, we had good fun. Yeah. We have nice fellowship, we have good food, we crack jokes. We're not like, again, we're not like these Puritan bozos, yeah. <clears throat> so one thing that happens, see, as a, as a pastor, as a leader of anything, of a Bible study, home group, church, whatever, one of your responsibility is to protect your congregation from worldly influences. You need to preach hard against sin. You need to preach against compromises. You know, you need to preach the Bible. Hey, you know what? don't fellowship, don't get along with the unbelievers. Let's go soul winning. Let's work as a team together. 
That's the job of a pastor. That's the job of a leader. Yeah. When pastors open the doors and say, hey, yeah, bring your unbelieving friends. Go fellowship with them. Go interact with them. You know, they are leading their congregation into sin. They're leading their friends into sin. You know, I've seen a pattern among these kind of churches. There's a lot of fornication that's happening. There's a lot of fornication that happens. When you open your door, say, we as a Christian group, we will not create boundaries between us and the unbelievers. We will include them. We'll pray with them. We'll read the Bible with them. Fornication happens a lot. Fornication is a sin. Any church, anywhere, if fornication is not preached against, it will happen. Because that is the society we live in. If fornication is not preached against, even, even if in a group like this, let me tell you this, if we don't preach against fornication, <coughs> it will happen. Because that's the like most common sin. There needs to be strong, hard preaching against fornication. Yeah. And there's another thing that I've seen. This is the most shameless thing that believers do. Biggest danger I've seen in the home group, in all these groups, interfaith groups. Believers end up getting married to unbelievers. And that's the stupidest thing that I've ever seen in my whole life. Believers marrying unbelievers. Sorry. In the home group, again, let me tell you a story. <laughs> there was this one uh, girl in the home group, yeah? She was uh, studying medicine in the university in Leipzig. And there she met some guy who was also studying medicine. And they fell in love. So she would bring him to the home group week after week, whenever they're there. So we all got to know him. And most of the time he would sit there as if like, what am I doing here? <laughs> Why am I here? <laughs> kind of. And so um, we decided, okay, we, we, we thought about it. Okay, this, she's saved. She's a believer. He's not saved. And we all decided, let's pray for him. Let's pray for him. Every Friday we would sit in groups. Uh, we pray for that he will open his heart to you. That he will get into a relationship with you. <laughs> You know, just to pray for him like nonstop. After a couple of years, I think two years or something, they got engaged. Yeah, ring on their finger, they got engaged. And I was a little worried, yeah, because I come from India, conservative family. So I started asking around, did he get saved? Did he get saved? Apparently not. He didn't get saved. And, and here's one more information. They have a common hobby, both of them, yeah. They're into mountain climbing. They would constantly climb mountains, have the helmet and the right gear. They would climb mountains, professional climbing. So I, uh, I used to ask my friends, hey, he's not a Christian. He's, he's, he shouldn't be like warn her from marrying that guy. It's like, no, he's a really good guy. He's a, he's a very not charming guy. And by the way, they have something in common together. They do mountain climbing. They have something. Why, why do you want to break? Seriously? Is mountain climbing more important to you than heaven and hell? Isn't that what the world runs after? Oh, we have the same favorite color, let's get married. We have the same favorite food, let's get married. We have the same type of music taste, yeah? Let's get married. That's what, that's the stupid world is after that. And when believers start talking about these things, I mean, are you stupid or what? Are you foolish or what? It's more important than serving the Lord. It's more important than the Bible. Your oh, favorite sport, oh, I got married because we have to play the same sport. You're an idiot. You know, and, and I've heard this argument, these Christians, they say, oh, I know some couple somewhere, uh, the, the other spouse, they got saved and now they're serving the Lord. So if it happened to them, it should also happen to me. My unbelieving spouse will also get saved one day. Let me tell you how this works. There are couples, it's actually true in some of our cases, you know, here sitting as well. When you got married, both of you were not saved. You were not saved. You didn't know any better. You were in the world and you got married and somewhere down the line, one of you got saved and you led your other spouse to the Lord. You got your other spouse saved. You know, when you're saved, God is merciful to you. He gives you the, when, when you're really 
seeking the Lord, when you really want to work for the Lord, when you want to serve Jesus, He will give you the spirit. He'll give you the boldness. He will answer your prayer. Wherein you get your spouse saved. You get your children saved. You know, but if you, being a believer, you know that it is wrong to marry an unbeliever, and you still go and marry that unbeliever, God, you know what happens? That person will never end up getting saved. God will put a thorn, okay? You, you willfully entered into that sinful, committed that sin. Of course, now once you're married, now these couple, these uh, people uh, in the home group, they got married. They are married. And back then, I was not an NIFB Christian. I was a watered-down Christian, yeah? So I went along with that. Okay, they got married. I even went to their wedding and played songs. <laughs> Stupid me. Yeah, but now when I think about it, I mean, I regret. Why didn't I like shake her and say, don't do it. Don't do it. You're an idiot. Why do you want to marry that guy? You're a Christian. You're a believer. And these people, learn, uh, and, uh, and, and just, just, just imagine, their children grow up and they're not godly at all. They have children, they're not godly, and they're crying, eh, pray for my child, pray for my husband. They're not saved. Yeah, you married them, you idiot. When the Bible clearly says, what, the Bible, what does the Bible say? Turn with me to Exodus chapter 34. Exodus chapter 34, please. While you're turning there, I'll read from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked with unbelievers. It's black on white, clear as day. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? You are a person who's got the light as a believer. You want to marry somebody who's got darkness in them? Proverbs chapter 13 verse 20, I'll read it. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Yeah, Exodus chapter 34. Let me turn there myself. Sorry. Exodus chapter 34 from verse 12. I mean, these are clear commandments. You know, we know how God feels about a believer unmarrying an unbeliever, a believer marrying an unbeliever. Okay. Exodus chapter 34. I'll read from verse 12. Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, whither thou goest lest it be a snare in the midst of thee. But ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves, for thou shalt worship no other God. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the Lord, and they go a whoring after their gods, and do sacrifice unto their gods, and one call thee, and thou eat of his sacrifice. And thou take of their daughters unto thy sons, and their daughters go a whoring after their gods, and make thy sons go a whoring after their gods. Thou shalt make thee no molten gods. It's a clear commandment. Don't, don't get married with the inhabitants of the land. You know, we should marry other believers. We should get married to like-minded believers. You know, at least, at least somebody who saved. Please. Don't, 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 don't be foolish and get married to some person. Make, be doubly sure that the person is saved. And of course, in a movement like this, I would definitely say, hey, try to find somebody who's in the same movement. <laughs> or at least marry somebody who is teachable, who can uh, subject yourself, whom you know will subject herself to me as a man. Okay. Now, this is something that I've seen mostly among women. Believers who get married to unbelievers. I don't know why. I've seen mostly among women. More than it happens with men. Even in the home group that I was telling you, mostly it was the women who went, married the believers. I mean, I don't. I, it's it's. It, I get angry at this. I get really angry when I whenever I come across people. Even back in India, I knew Christians who went married married a Hindu. See, we are actually as soul winners. We are we are trying to get people saved. We are toiling under the sun. We are freezing in winter. Our legs are hurting when we stand and tell them the, the gospel. We, we get to face all the embarrassment, all the no, and all the stuff. We have to deal with all that. And on the other hand, of course, when we are publishing work, when we are making videos, me and brother Anzel, we are trying to defend our faith 
against all their stupid beliefs or all their stupid religion and they're constantly like offending us, criticizing us and you want to be an idiot and marry an unbeliever? Don't do that man. You know God will punish you for that. Let me tell you, if you marry an unbeliever, God will punish you for that. He will put a problem in your life that will never go away. You want to make a mess out of your life? Yeah, go marry that heathen person. Do you want to make God jealous? Really? God is all powerful, all but he can take away your breath in an instant. You want to make him jealous? Do you want to make an enemy out of God? Don't marry an unbeliever. And this is something that I've constantly seen. I've, I've even come, a, come across people who say, um, Oh, I want to marry this uh, Hindu chick so I can get her saved. How do, you, how do you convert a Hindu by marrying them? That's a stupid answer. No. I'll tell you something. Okay, another story. I didn't prepare this. When I was in the university back in India, I liked the girl in my class. Yeah? She was Hindu. Back then, I was not a serious Christian. You know, I wasn't reading my Bible. I wasn't a soul winner. I was, I was in the world. And, oh, she was beautiful, and I was just infatuated. You know, these emotions, and this, you know, this uh, crush, this teenage crush. And of course, back at the head, back, uh, back of my head, I knew it, it never works. out. It's a stupid thing. You know, she's a Hindu. I'm a Christian. What seriously? Do, what do I have to deal with her idols? You know. <laughs> And, uh, but I told her one day, I went to her and said, hey, I like you. Would you like to consider a relationship? Yeah. And of course she said, no, yeah, I don't like you. <laughs> and I knew that. I knew that, of course. But the reason why I did it was because I was in that phase where it's like, I need to face my fears. You know, I need to do something which, I, which I'm afraid of. So now I want to be a man kind of thing. But amen. She said, no, amen. Praise God. <laughs> yeah. You know, there are men, I've known men of my same age who went to some Hindu woman and said, I like you, would you consider a relationship? And they said, yes. And they destroyed their life after that. She said, yes. They, they, of course, the one thing that happens is fornication and that's, that's, that's a big sin. And sometimes it ends up in a marriage and that's, it's gone. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, I consider marrying an unbeliever to be the, one of the most stupidest thing a Christian can do. Even worse than just simply fornication or probably even worse than adultery. You know, adultery is something that you get right with the Lord. There'll be consequences. Okay, you can still get right with the Lord, but marrying an unbeliever is forever. Till death do you apart. You cannot unmarry that person once you marry them. And you are the one and this, this Christian who marries an unbeliever, they will become worldly. They'll have to deal with a bunch of idols in their home. They have to deal with some puja room, some shrine in their home. And them being a believer. Yeah, they have to deal with uh, all the worldly music, the movies. And they'll come on Sundays, they'll come and bug, bug everybody. Pray for me, pray for me. You know, sometimes when I come across these people. Yeah? I come across these people who are really struggling because they're married and unsaved person. And... Uh, when they're telling the problems to me, I'm like, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But inside, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> you deserve that. <laughs> yeah, who told you to marry that person? When the Bible clearly says you knew it was wrong. People are warning you. Don't do it. Okay, anyways, let me, let me go forward. More, almost uh, till the end, don't, I won't take one and a half hours. <laughs> um, <clears throat> how to reach Hindus? One thing uh, I want to say, as, as people who are in Europe, in Germany, one thing you must have noticed that Hindus are very unreceptive. <laughs> Hindus are extremely unreceptive. Even I've heard from brothers and sisters in the FWBC, they, they keep saying, yeah, we come across Hindus a lot, but a lot of them just don't get saved. They just don't get saved. We have a handful of Hindus we got people saved. We are not as successful with them. I'll tell you why. It's not because they're Hindus. See, I, I preached a sermon before called How to Get Muslims Saved. How to Convert Muslims. That I, I explained that there, there are actually cursed people. That religion basically curses them. To a point where they're not receptive. Most of the Muslims are not receptive. 
because their religion purposefully attacks the core doctrines of Christianity. They know what we believe. Yeah, but it, Hinduism is very, it's a very open-minded, broad kind of a religion. They're like accept everything kind of, you know, they're not like fundamentalist type. Of course, you, you just told me that there was a group, but yeah. most of them aren't like that, which I've known. Yeah. <clears throat> the reason why in Europe, in the Western world, the reason why Hindus are unreceptive to the gospel is not because they're Hindus, but because they're rich. It's because they're rich, they're unreceptive to the gospel. See, India, let, let me explain that. In India, 68.8% of people are poor. They're below the poverty line, which means that they live on daily wages. If they don't work a day, they have nothing to eat that day. See, if I, if I, if I don't get paid for one or two months, I can still survive, you know. But in India, you don't work. There is no weekend for these people. They have to work, it's labor work, yeah? And these guys don't have the money to buy a plane ticket to anywhere. And, and in any place, it's the poor people who are receptive. Poor people are receptive to the gospel. And I'll just read a verse from Matthew chapter 11, verse 5. You don't have to turn there. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, Jesus saying, the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Right in Matthew chapter 26, he says, For ye have the poor always with you. you know, even in the Bible, we see, we learn that, hey, we need to approach the poor people more than we approach the rich people. Even when we started soul winning, wasn't wasn't one of our uh, destinations Halle? Why? Because we figured out that Halle is the city with the least income. Yeah? <clears throat> see, obviously, poor people are humble, you know, they're not arrogant. When you approach them with grace and love, they're willing to spend time with you. They know what it means to you know, have that human interaction. And when they hear the gospel, of course, when you get to hear the gospel, you understand, you do get saved. And unfortunately for you people, you know, all the receptive Hindus are actually in India. <laughs> Poor people. And there's a lot of missionary work that happens. With them. I've known the church where my parents go to, they constantly go to the slums, these poor villages and they're getting a lot of people saved because they're receptive. And the people who come here, they're usually well off. I'm not saying they're all millionaires. I mean, they at least are, they could afford a flight ticket. That's really expensive for Indians. Yeah, they, they um, <clears throat> even if they run down, if they, even if they go to a problem, they know that their parents will do whatever it takes to get them out of their problematic situation. They'll put the house on mortgage and they will never go and want, they'll never have problem, they'll, money is not an issue and, and they are comfortable, yeah? And I'll tell you one thing, my experience, the receptive ones, I've, I've, I've got Hindus saved, yeah, very few people in Leipzig and these are people who are fresh out of India, the first semester students, they just come from India, they're just walking with a selfie stick, hey, Europe, Europe. You know, the European poison hasn't struck them yet. They haven't understand the comfort and luxury of Europe. They, that pride hasn't hit that level yet. They're still very humble. They just got off the red bus. Okay, most of you don't know what that means. In India, you have villages and you have cities. Usually the buses connecting the villages and the cities are usually red in color, especially from the where, area where I'm from. And sometimes they get a seat in a, some university, the big city. So these guys, they come with all their luggages and they're so out of civilization. They don't know, they're all, they're like very dumb people. They're like, eh, what? Kind of. And if some, some of our friends, sometimes they act clumsy, they act weird. We just tell them, hey, did you just get off a red bus? You know, why are you acting as if you don't know? <laughs> you know, as if you're so backward kind of. So these Indians are like that when they come from India, they're like, they don't know how to spend money, they don't know how to talk, you know, they're doing things in public which usually people don't, it's a cultural difference, yeah? <clears throat> so they just got off the red bus, that's what we say. Yeah, and it, there are Indians like that who will go to Hamburg thinking you'll find good hamburgers there. Yeah, they'll go to Berlin and think every stupid wall with graffiti is the Berlin wall. You know, they take, start, start taking uh, uh, selfies and pictures. Hey, these guys are receptive for your information for a short period of time. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and um, 
yeah, if, if you're in a university city where there are universities, try, try to approach the Indians during the month of September, October, or whenever the <laughs> semester begins. Yeah, you'll have some success there. <clears throat> India, as I said before, India, there's a lot of Indians who live in poverty. Yeah? That's good? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> when uh, me and brother Anzan, we make the video, uh, sorry, me and brother Anthony, when we made the video on uh, Christian Samraj, there was this one guy from Chennai who called me up. Moses, why are you doing this? Why are you exposing this pastor on video? Yeah, he was rebuking me. Moses, there is there's a lot of persecution in India. Yeah, there's a lot of. Uh, um, <clears throat> uh, the, the, he was telling some stories about uh, they they shut down some Catholic church. They arrested some nuns. Yeah, we are Christians are under threat. Why are you criticizing this pastor? I was like, wait a minute. A Catholic church got shut down. Nuns got arrested. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. You know, shut down these churches, Lutheran churches, the Anglican churches, you know, and, and uh, actually there, there are people, there, the, the nationalists who go and burn down these churches Amen. sometimes. Amen. They, they are bozo churches anyways. They're dragging people to hell. They don't have the right gospel in these churches. I mean, should I, should I feel pity? Oh, there are Christians there. The Christians in India who said, oh, they burned down a Lutheran church. They're beating a Lutheran pastor. Hallelujah! <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. I'm not advocating violence. I'm not saying that it's okay for anyone to take the law into their own hands and attack. I believe in freedom of religion. Anywhere. People should have the right to exercise their religion. I believe that. Okay? And uh, there are people who take the law into their own hands and attack people for religion. They should be punished. I believe that. Okay. But on the other hand, when these false churches, when they get burned down, why should I pity them? I'm like, okay, God is you. Christians are failing. You know, God will use these people to punish them. Isn't that what God, how God acted in the Old Testament? Whenever Israelites, they started whoring after other gods, he used Wicked nations like Babylon, Assyria to attack them. And then, of course, once he judged Israel, of course, he judged these nations, right? So pretty sure God is going to use these Hindu nationalists, these extremists to attack all these bozo churches who are dragging the name of Jesus in the mud. Burn them. I don't care. And of course, I'm not, as I said, burn them when there are no people inside, yeah? There are a lot of innocent, for example, there were the Sri Lankan bombings that happened right? a couple of years ago. There were these Islamic terrorists who went with their suicide bombs and uh, they blew up churches when there were people sitting there. And that's horrible. You burn these churches on when there's nobody there. And, you, and then you put the pastor in the prison. Even this Christian Samraj, eh? shut down the church, preaching a false gospel. You know, uh, I, there's a, even this, I sent you a video. Yeah? This guy is wearing this clown gown and he's having all the young people also wearing the clown gown and they're walking up and down the church with some metal things in their hands <laughs> hocus pocus and i've been to that church actually you know and this uh, christian samraj is wearing the huge lutheran thala thing and there is in the church in the front of the church there is like the holy of holies where nobody's allowed to enter only he's allowed to enter there's a small wooden fence with a wooden gate yeah, and there's a table with an open Bible and other silver and gold crap along with it. And there's a golden cross. And he will go there and he will, you know, and with his back turned to the church. Shut down that stupid church. It doesn't, doesn't do uh, any work for the Lord. It's not getting anybody saved. He, he's, a, he's a kind of person who's influencing Hindus to become better Hindus. What kind of a church is that? What kind of a pastor is that? And, uh, you know, and I, and I believe that there are, there are um, <clears throat> these, these false churches, let me tell you, one of the false things that they do, they have this hierarchy, they have this diocese, they have these bishops and all these things. Yeah? They go to these uh, poor people sometimes in some poor village and they tell them, why don't you become a Christian? So you come to church and you vote for me. 
that that's the wrong way that's a stupid that's a such a that's what politicians do they go and give uh, people alcohol and biryani the food say so you vote for me and christians they constantly throw it on our face sorry hindu hindus in india they constantly throw it, oh you go to poor people offer money and uh, get them converted or you give them a bag of rice and you get them converted yeah and people i'm pretty sure it's these bozos these lutheran anglican bozos who do that probably and i don't speak for them that's a wrong way to convert people and and sometimes they use this argument against christians real christians and they say oh you guys are using money you guys are helping uh, helping the poor people and winning them you know what if you if you're so concerned about the poor people why don't you give them a bag of rice Amen. hindus don't do that they don't help the poor people they're they're filled with caste issues you know what the, these poor people they they want to become christians because they know that in a church there is a sense of belongingness that people will help them that you know them becoming christians will not keep them in poverty because god is going to supply their needs and these guys throw it in our face oh you you give them a bag of rice and get them saved yeah, shut up what i'm saying is that there are poor people in india yeah and these poor people are receptive and, and of course a lot of missionaries who go there and uh, evangelize and what about the indians in here but we still tell them the gospel all the indians who are living here in uh, <clears throat> Germany the lot of them are not poor but i'm pretty sure every now and then you'll come across somebody who's receptive to the gospel because why exceptions are everywhere there are always exceptions are all atheists will uh, unreceptive to the gospel no not really there are atheists who will get saved are all hindus unreceptive to the gospel no there are hindus who will get saved yeah and i'll just uh, finally close with some soul winning tips okay <clears throat> as i said one of the soul winning tips find them at the beginning of a semester yeah and the second second is uh, this is what i do they they usually believe in reincarnation if i ask them hey what's going to hap happen to you after the, after you die they say uh, most of the people who are hindus they say i'm going to be reborn i'm going to be reincarnated when i die this is what i say hey you know what reincarnation goes hand in hand with caste system which means that if you live a good life in your next life you'll be born in an upper caste yeah so according to this theory there are also untouchables do you believe that do you believe that there are people who are lower than other people do you believe in that hierarchy and most people who got brains they say no other no we don't believe that and 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 i've seen germans who give these answers you know i'll be reincarnated and I tell them hey it's the nazis who believe that blue blue blau blau i get blue eyed blonde haired people are better than the others do you believe that kind of a thing oh no no i don't believe that and that's where i start off hey, you know what there's heaven there's hell you know and the, the romans road begins there T uh, help uh, so all these things what happens after death try to tackle that at the beginning not at the end hey the bible says there's heaven and hell and if they're believing something else may, may tell them the truth about it right at the beginning so that you don't have to deal with it at the end of the gospel presentation yeah very important thing last thing explain faith in jesus alone explain faith in jesus especially when they're believing in other gods yeah you you need to turn their faith you need to help them turn their faith from all the other gods and the thing is when i'm talking to these hindus i don't name their gods i don't pronounce the names of their gods we shouldn't do that yeah and so what i say is hey <clears throat> you know in india there are people like gandhi and mother teresa who people really exalt them they're celebrated they're good people and uh, they're considered good people yeah of course and maybe somebody will even make a temple and make them gods maybe gandhi will become a god in 2 200 years mother teresa will become a goddess in 200 years they will make statues and there are already statues of these people yeah. and uh, <clears throat> but i tell them would you trust them would you trust gandhi would you trust mother teresa to take you to heaven just because they're good people what i'm trying to tell them is their gods whom they're worshiping they were actually historical figures some of them they ba they fought battles they were involved in that and this this and that so would you trust them to take you into heaven or would you trust jesus who died for you 
you know, tell them nicely. Don't tell them, hey, your gods are demons. You know, <laughs> we're not there to do that. Although it's the truth, we are there to tell them, hey, you know, the, these gods, they cannot save you. Of course, in a church like this, of course, we talk smack about Hinduism and all that, no problem. But when you're with the Hindus, I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to offend them. You know, be nice to them. Try to just gently help them understand turning from the false religion into true religion. Yeah which is the blood of Jesus. Believe on the Jesus Christ only and you will be saved. Let's bow down our heads and pray. 